And so, Father, we ask you all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated, and as you're seated, we'll have Dr. Dominic Aquila come up again. Dr. Aquila is president of New Geneva Theological Seminary, with branches in Colorado Springs, Fredericksburg, and Egypt, Cairo, Egypt as well. He's also a good friend, and he's a blessing to us every year that he comes, and he ministers God's word to us in a missions conference. So thank you, thank you Dr. Aquila. <clears throat> As I say each uh, year I come, that uh, it's always a delight uh, to be here. Um, when my, uh, the year starts and we get a nice big calendar that we use for the house because we have so much activity that my wife is filling in things and she gets to March and uh, says, okay, here comes that second weekend of March. I know you'll be in Fredericksburg, so I'm marking that now. You know? So it's, uh, it, it just as regular as clockwork or as uh, calendar work uh, goes on. And we're delighted to be here to see uh, what God is doing along with the instructions that the New Geneva is bringing uh, to this area. So uh, we rejoice that we have this uh, extension, which is now going into its 21st year. And now New Geneva is celebrating its 30th year this year uh, in Colorado Springs. Uh, so we rejoice that uh, we were able to um, also do this extension and the one in Egypt as well. Let me invite you now and in your, turn your Bibles to uh, Matthew chapter 16, a very familiar passage in, uh, beginning at verse 13, reading through verse 20. So let's listen and give our attention, even as the Word of God is read, that it will have its impact on us uh, as we read it. Matthew 16, beginning at verse 13. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed One, the Son of the Living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And then he strictly charged the disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ. And thus far the reading of God's word. From the very beginning of the New Testament form of the church to the present time there have been obituaries written for the church or at least anticipated obituaries uh, because the thought was that uh, the church is not gonna last and so we might as well write the obituary. And uh, go ahead and said, uh, lived a life uh, but now is dead and gone. And uh, there are forces that have been trying to put it aside and kill it uh, through every age, whether in the first century, the second, the third, or 20th or 21st, and the church is still here. And it is here not because of anything that we've done as much as what Christ has done. Uh, but there have been attempts. I mean, even if you, you think back to the uh, early church, just within a few weeks of Pentecost, you already had Ananias and Sapphira who uh, brought deceit into the life of the church uh, when they uh, lied to the Holy Spirit about what they were bringing as an offering uh, to the church. They didn't have to, but it says, and Satan deceived them. Uh, he tried to kill the church then. Uh, the next chapter in Acts 6, uh, there was a division of uh, who, what kind of ministry the widows would receive. And it was very divisive, and so Satan was trying to work to break apart the church at that time. In other words, things happen in every generation that it looks like, well, the church won't survive. And even up to our own time, we say the church may not be relevant. That's, you know, the scuttlebutt that's out there uh, talking about the church. It just won't survive. Uh, there are too many things that are wrong. It's not relevant to the age in which we're living or something of that order. Uh, but the very fact is this, that Jesus says, no, it's his church. And as the title of the sermon indicates, really, Christ really is building his church. 
uh, it belongs to him, doesn't belong to us. Now, we try and make uh, attempts to uh, own it, uh, but it doesn't work. No, it belongs to Christ. And what this passage uh, gives us and tells us is a couple of number of three things anyway that I'll point out that I think really should encourage us about what Christ intends for the church. And there's no obituary, and it will not end until Jesus comes again and the church militant, which we are now, will become the church triumphant when we now then are in heaven. Uh, so the, here are the three things is Jesus meeting with the disciples near the end of the three years of ministry. Uh, he speaks to them, and we start in the middle of this passage in verse 18, where Jesus says, and you are Peter, and I tell you that you're Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. If you have your own Bible, not the Pew Bible or the church's Bible or anybody else's Bible, and you like to mark in your Bible, underline and underscore the word my. Uh, it's in the original, and it's also in our translation. Now, uh, Jesus says, it's my church, not our church. Uh, it is not something that we have put together. It's what God has put together in Christ. And so he owns it. He claims it. And therefore, he's the one who takes care of it. And we join in on the church that Christ is building. Now, how do we know it's his? Well, he claims ownership of it because he came to redeem a people for himself and, uh, and populates the church through that. Uh, he came with a very distinct mission. Uh, we're told Joseph, the angel told it, Joseph, you will call his name Jesus because he will save his people from their sin. And when they are saved, they will be incorporated into the life of the church. That was the mission of Jesus, to come and build a church. These didn't come just to be a good moral prophet. He didn't come to be a good teacher. He didn't come to take care of the poor, although those things are wrapped up in some of the things that are happening. But that's not why he came. He came to die for sinners and to incorporate them into a church that he is building. He owns it. Uh, we're told, for instance, in uh, Ephesians 4, that when Jesus ascended on high, he, gave give, he ascended on high, he gave gifts to the church. Uh, he, he did it and he said that it's the uh, giftedness comes from Christ. And I think we need to make sure we understand this. It means that when we talk about spiritual gifts, that those gifts are not the gifts of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit does not give gifts. The Holy, it's Jesus who gives gifts to the church that are mediated through the Holy Spirit. But Jesus is the gift giver. And in that particular passage, they're the office gifts. So he gave gifts, and some are called apostles, and then prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. That is Christ doing it. And he gave those gifts so that the church might be built up, uh, that we might be equipped to get involved in the ministry that Jesus wants for the church. So the church follows its or it gets its direction from Christ, its founding is from Christ, he's building his church. He also uh, uh, holds his church accountable, and he does assessing. If you read in Revelation 2 and 3, you have the seven letters to the seven churches of Asia Minor. And he dictates that letter, those letters to John, and John writes them to those churches. And what does he do when he writes those churches? Each letter begins with something like this, I know you. I know who you are because I made you. I created you. I've put you there. I know you. And then he is able to know the inner workings of the church and all the people who make up that church, they belong to him. And uh, he says, I know you. And he gives the evaluation, the assessment, and tells them where they need to be encouraged, where correctives they need because uh, it's my church and I'm tweaking it, working through you. So here's the point. The, the church belongs to Jesus. We're just uh, passing through, and we need to be careful that we don't hold on to it so tightly, thinking that we are somehow going to be the Savior of the church. Jesus already is that. Now, here's the point that we need to understand. Jesus, in building his church, could have used any number of ways in order to do that. But here's what Scripture tells us he has done. He says, I am building my church, and I will use and am using sinners who are redeemed to do it. And I will gift them. I will provide for them. I will give them direction. I'll give them the word. And then they're to be useful to building the church. Uh, but I'm, it's my church. But I'm using, that's what he used. God could, Christ could have used any number of other means. He could have written the notes in the cloud. 
but he chose to use people whom he redeems. And so when we look at that, uh, we have a, a picture because of what Jesus said he, is, he would do is that you and I then who come into the church and because of the giftedness of Christ, as he's building his church, what does he do? We become indispensable. We become necessary because of that which Christ has done. Not because we determine that. And we become necessary, indispensable, useful, necessary in the life of the church. It's amazing. So each one of you here who knows the Lord Jesus Christ are part of the church. And you are an indispensable part of what God intends to do through his son Jesus Christ in the church. I'm building my church, he says. If we want to sort of break this down a little bit and see how... Uh, uh, Paul, uh, use the example of Paul in terms of a place where he saw this and explained it from a different angle. And here it is from the Philippians chapter 1. And in Philippians 1, he is, is in Roman imprisonment. So he knows his time isn't too long, although he got out of the first Roman imprisonment, then had a second one later. Uh, but he, it came to his realization that as he's ministering to the church and the where position he had as an apostle, that it came to him that uh, he really was called by Christ and had this passionate relationship with Christ. That's the reason he says in Philippians 1.21, a passage we hold dear to ourselves, uh, that, um, that in, you know, I find myself in Christ. Uh, that to, to know Christ and to understand Christ and to know Christ is good, but to die is better, is gain. So to live you know, for Christ is good, but dying is gain. And so he sort of takes up that theme of dying, and he goes on to say, and so I'm ready, verse 23, to depart and be with Jesus. I'm really ready to go. And you can almost see the Philippians. He had a really good relationship with the Philippian church, by the way. It's one of the, the few churches that he actually took gifts from because they knew how to give without strings attached. And so he always used them as a model. The church in Macedonia, that's Philippi was used as an example. But anyway, he says, um, I'm ready to depart. And you can almost say when they're reading that in church, this new letter arrives from Paul in Rome, and he says that, and they'll go, oh, Paul, you can't do that. <laughs> You're too important. You're an apostle. You're a preacher. You're a pastor, a church planter, a mentor. You're going to write one-third or more of the New Testament. You can't go. You're too important. And Paul is saying, I don't think so. Why? Because I'm a servant of Christ. Christ is building his church, and for what, right now, he's using me. And so don't, get dis don't despair. When its time is up, I'm ready to go because I'm liberated to go. And Jesus will fill the slot just as quickly and, as uh, anything. And so he, he was very comfortable with that. The rest of the church, was, no, 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 we need you. You're too important. The church can't survive without you. Paul didn't buy into that. Now, he does go on to say then, after he says, I'm ready to depart and be with Jesus, and that'll be far better. Why? To, die, to, to have Christ is life, gain, uh, life, but to have Christ is gain. Oh, being with Christ is greater, so why should I want to stay here anyway? <laughs> you know? But he goes on to say, but I have a sense that God is not ready to right yet take me and I'm to remain here because he wants me to continue to have fruitful ministry and he almost said ah shucks because I was ready to go and he was comfortable with the whole idea he didn't take his press clippings that seriously see that's the point that we need to see that that is how he saw himself as indispensable because of the calling of Christ and that's the way we need to hold on to this as well. That we are part that Jesus builds his church because he makes us indispensable until we're not. He makes us necessary until we're not. But what do we get? We get gain. We get Christ, just like Paul did. Now, until that time, I want you to see how important you are because Christ intends to work through you. That's his intent. And you, so you're not just some schlep on the, the pew here, occupying space. You have an important place to play. 
and role in the life of the church because Christ is building his church and he uses all of us as his indispensable uh, parts of it. So whenever we get a little uppity and maybe some things are going well and we've maybe accomplished some good purposes in the life of the church, which we should, and we think, well, well uh, no one seems to be listening to me, so I'll, you know, uh, I'll just go somewhere else and, and everything will fall apart. Well, when you get yourself in a little sort of cocky like that, Paul never had that cockiness, by the way. I, I want you to get a nice big glass of water, fill it right up to the top, put it on the table, and then stick your finger in it, take your index finger, put it in there, and just hold it there for a while. Now, you occupying space in that water. It, it, you know, you, you can see it, it's there. But now pull it out, and what happens? Just like that, the hole's filled. And just as quickly as finger comes out, hole's filled, is how quickly you can be replaced. Now, does that make you feel good? <laughs> You're probably going to say, well, let's stop right now. You know? <laughs> uh-uh, no, 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 no. That, that's not it's said in order to minimize you. It's order to, to say, as long as God wants you, you, you have that finger there. You're important but he will be able to replace you when it's time and leave it to him on that time. Paul was satisfied with this. And the, one of my ministry verses from Acts 13, 30, 36, Paul preaches the, to the Pisidian Antioch, the longest sermon that we have recorded in the book of Acts. And uh, in talking about it, he's, he's there reasoning from the scriptures in order to persuade those who are listening who, because they were Jews in the synagogue, they knew the Old Testament, but they didn't really understand it, that it was pointing all to Christ. So he's explaining it, calling one scripture after another scripture, because they were at least acquainted with them, and saying, by the way, it's fulfilled in Christ, fulfilled in Christ. So he's pointing to Christ. And at one point, he does like uh, Peter does in the uh, sermon in uh, Pentecost, and he points to David. David was an important part of God's redemptive history. He played, a, he, he was significant in that point. And uh, so in uh, Peter's case, being in Jerusalem at Pentecost, he could point to, and he says, over there, there's David, uh, important in God's economy. But there's his tomb, and what's inside that tomb? Nothing but dusty old bones. He doesn't say that, but uh, you get the picture. Uh, David was important. So how does Paul wrap it up? Verse 13, 36. When David had served the purposes of God in his generation, he fell asleep. That's, that's Bible speak for he died. David was important. God raised him up. Apple of God's eyes. Uh, we love to read David's Psalms because they're so real, uh, earthy, important. But as important as he was, he'd served God's purpose in his generation he was called home. The same thing Paul said will happen to me. We need to know our place. Like I said, Paul didn't take his press clippings that seriously because he realized that it's Christ's church. And he's building his church. He's organizing it. He's directing it. So there's no obituary going to be written that church is going to fail because any of us here are to walk away or we die. But until then, you have a purpose, and that purpose is to be involved in the church that he's building because you are essential to that because of what Christ did, but you are not to hold on to it so tightly that you think it's mine. It isn't. So have that balance that the Apostle Paul had. So what Jesus says here, it's my church. Now to put more context on that, secondly, it's also a confessing church. So it's Christ's church. It's a confessing church. Now notice how this narrative, the context, it's near the end of the third year of earthly ministry for Jesus and his disciples. For three years, he has these disciples walking with him. He called them personally, the apostles in particular, and then other disciples along the way. And uh, so here they are, and Jesus now asks them a question. He's, in essence, he was Gallup before Gallup was Gallup. You know, Gallup uh, asks questions all the time about what people think about religion and the church and things like that. And uh, so he asked the question, who do people say I am? 
In other words, what's the scuttlebutt about me? Uh, they had their ear to the ground, finger to the pulse, and because they gave an answer. Well, they think that you're either uh, Jeremiah, they thought there was reincarnation, I guess, uh, or uh, John the Baptist, Elijah, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. So uh, you, the kind of ministry you have looks like that. And uh, so they, you know, everybody has an opinion about Jesus. Now, what, what the answer they gave about what do people say was wrong. Jesus isn't a reincarnation of anybody. He is the Son of God who's come from heaven, sent on a mission to die for sinners, and the mission was eventually to gather in his people, all right? So they were wrong. So by the way, when Gallup and others take these things and we say, here's what the world thinks about Christ and thinks about the church and so forth, <laughs> pshaw, throw it out. It's irrelevant. That does not set the agenda for the church. We get all rattled. Well, if the church, the world thinks that way, well, we better adjust it to get uh, better in sync with the life of the world. No. As I'll say in a moment, the world is darkness. They don't know nothing or anything. I said that. Don't correct me. I got it. <laughs> but you have to have, uh, you see, you're paying attention if you got the nothing versus anything, okay? Right? All right, now, the point I'm making is this, that they had their opinion. He said, okay, but I'm more interested in what you think. So who do you, you've been with me all this time, who do you say that I am? And notice how Peter answers for the group. He said, um, Simon replied, you, in verse 16, you are the Christ, you are the Messiah, you're the anointed one. You are the son of the living God. There it is, a confession. Very simple. No convoluted theological uh, uh, statements or words. It's very simple. Here's who you are, because that's what you've revealed to us. You are the Christ. You are the Messiah. You're the one whom God promised through Abraham and now have come to full courage. We see that. And then uh, Jesus commands him. Look at verse uh, 17. He answered him, you are right, Simon, son of Jonah. And flesh and blood has not revealed it. That is, human beings. You didn't get it out of a history book. You didn't get it out of a genealogy book. Uh, there was no uh, other prescription about him. So it wasn't a flesh and blood kind of thing. Well, you, you're the genealogy. He did come out of a genealogy, but not the one that the world thinks about. So it wasn't a human orientation. Jesus is not a creation of the world or of human history. Not at all. No. How do I know that you are the Messiah? Because he's not revealed through flesh and blood, but my Father in heaven has made this known to you. Christianity at base is a revealed religion. It's revealed by the Father through the mechanism of the Word and the word that, this Word that He has given us prompted by the Spirit. And so it is different. It is unique. And so the church that is confessing is important. It confesses that. And we're not confessing here where well, we have all these uh, reasons, apologetic reasons, for God, the existence of God and the proof that Jesus was really born, proving all the things about the resurrection. And we always think that we, we can bring rational elements to prove that uh, this happened. Now, there's a place for rational reasoning, but the dead mind cannot understand the things of God left to themselves. So of all the rationality by itself will not prove the existence of God or the proof that Jesus is the Messiah. Only revealed by the Father. In other words, a confessing church believes because we believe that there is a true God who has revealed himself and he's made himself known that for us now in the pages of Scripture. Now, confession, what is it? A confession, uh, sometimes it gets here, by the way, because we think, well, that's a human orientation. Forget it. It isn't. The revelation comes in Scripture. And what revelation that a confession is, is it's a way of us being able to say what we know should be included and what should be excluded. Okay, what is he saying is, 
the, pe the world, I asked you, who, who do people say I am? They say you're Jeremiah, you're John the Baptist, something like that. Well, they're excluded because that's not true. The confession has to be, you are Jesus, sent by the Father. And he's revealed him to your, him, you to us. And he blessed him for saying that. So a confessing church includes as well as excludes by the very testimony that we have. We are a confessional church. And it's a human written document. But how did that human document come about? Someone didn't sit down and say, let me come up with all these highfalutin words and phrases and theological concepts. No. Go through scripture from Genesis 1 through Revelation 22 and you gather the data and says, here's what it says about God, about creation, about uh, the fall, about redemption, about Jesus, about the Holy Spirit, about the church, and so forth. You get all this data from the scriptures, you're doing your exposition, and then you put it in propositional form, and you have a confession, or catechetical form, question and answer, and you have a catechism. And all they're doing is saying, this is what scripture teaches. Now, do you believe it? you're in. You're included. You don't believe it? You're excluded. Simple. You don't believe that uh, in a Trinitarian God and you, you say we can't prove it? Well, we believe that Scripture teaches that, so it's included in our confession. You're excluded. Well, so what's wrong with that? We now know what we believe, and we're able to have that confession. The Apostles' Creed was one of the earliest ones that we have in the church. Why did the church write it? It was ordered to say this is what we believe over against uh, what the pagan world believes and the secular world believes and what false teachers are trying to bring in to say what religion is all about. And so we can say in uniform, uh, I believe in God the Father Almighty. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only begotten Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit, Trinitarian. And there it becomes our confession uh, and, uh, with regard to what we believe, who God is, and what we are to practice now, based on that, uh, then we look at this, the, the world that we have today, and I would put before you that tolerance is one of the highest values that the world claims to have. And by tolerance, I mean uh, not that you know, I'm going to tolerate what you say and they tolerate what I say. It's basically saying, I'm going to tolerate what, you, what I believe that you need to believe. Okay, I'm going to tolerate it for you. <laughs> okay. And uh, so, the, uh, so if you say anything that's uh, offensive, apparent, intolerant, that excludes, well, then they get all bent out of shape. The world does. Well, probably you do too. Because you don't like the idea of excluding. There are many, you know, roads up the mountaintop to the true God. And so we, um, we have uh, this view that we have everything should be exactly even. And uh, based on that, I'm going to put before you this proposition, that Jesus Christ, based on that definition, was the most intolerant person that ever lived on the face of the earth. <laughs> you know, why? Because look at what he said in John 14, in verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one, no one comes to the Father but by me. How Dear you, we say. You see that? But that is exactly what's happening here too. The same thing that's happened in John 14, same being here. Jesus is saying, what do you, who do you say I am? You're saying that I am the only way to the Father because that's the way God has ordered redemption. That's our message. That's our grounding. You take that away, we have nothing. So the church is a confessing church, and we see that here when you see the distinction between who do men say that I am and who do you say that I am it was revealed by the Father. If you're sitting here today and you believe that truth, it's because God has worked by His Spirit to bring you out of your deadness of sin and to a living relationship with the living God and the living Christ. So it's a, it's a Christ church. He's the one who owns it. He's the one who gives it his gifts. He holds us accountable. He's the one that will raise up and take down. That's his job. That's his church. And we're just passing through and trying to be faithful in the midst. It's a confessing church. 
because we believe that includes those who confess the same religion because the Father has revealed it and now we have it on the pages of Scripture. And then thirdly, it's a conquering church. Go back to verse 18. As a conquering church, it says, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. That's a mighty statement. What my church is doing is fighting against all the wiles of the evil one and uh, the gates of hell will not be able to stop the forceful advance of the people of God. Our tendency here, because uh, over the centuries, those verses and those words have been seen to be something like the, the, that hell, uh, Satan, is fighting against the church, which they're, they're, that is a true statement. Uh, so he, Satan tries to uh, upset the, the life of the church. Uh, he wants to bring on truth because he's a father of lies and a liar and a murderer from the beginning. So, yeah, there is opposition. There is always spiritual opposition. That, that goes with it. But in this passage, here's what it's not saying. And what it's not saying is that we consider the church like a um, castle with thick walls uh, around the um, the, uh, uh, you know, the, the, with thick walls holding behind which we live, and then there's a moat with all sorts of uh, critters in it that can, if you swim in it, you'll probably you know, be eaten up, and then it has a drawbridge. All right, so now the drawbridge is up, and whew, okay, we're behind the safe wall. Thick walls, high walls, moat, uh, all these critters in the moat. And uh, so then, ever so often, though, Jesus says, you've got to go into the world and make disciples. Oh, okay, I guess we go, we lower the drawbridge, and we run across. We go out in the, you know, the highways and byways and snatch as many people as we can, and we bring them across real hard, real quick. Okay, lift up the drawbridge real quick, real quick. And hopefully then we can get too many of the, those scooties on us, you know, from the world. Nasty, nasty world. That's how we usually vision it. And so now, oh, okay, I'm safe. That's not the picture Jesus is talking about here. That's a defensive mechanism. No, he here is a offensive. It's on the offense and in a proactive, affirmative way he's saying that Satan is the one who sets up walls that have gates. And behind those walls and gates are people who are held bondage. That is, people like you and me. Every one of us, when we're born, we're born in and with sin. Every one of us existed behind a wall. And we were slaves of Satan. We were in bondage. We were in darkness. We were blind. We, had, we couldn't do anything. We were, we were behind it. And he put a gate up so we couldn't get out. And now Jesus comes along and he says, my church is a mighty marching army armed with the gospel, not a physical sword, not flesh and blood. Remember, flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you. But with the gospel of grace, and it's a mighty arm in advancing against any opposition. So when you get to a wall that has a gate, you say, how can we do to knock it down so we can go into that city and get people out? That's what it's doing. We are the ones who are making the claims. We are on the offense. We're looking for where those gates are, knocking them down. And you say, how can we do that? Well, we have an example given to us in real history with uh, the people of God uh, coming out of Egypt. Where was Egypt? E Egypt was darkness. It was bondage. They were slaves. They couldn't do anything. You build bricks with straws, without straws. Just whatever Pharaoh says, do it. God says, I'm going to send a savior. His name is Moses. He was a type of Christ. Go and tell him, let my people go. They, they didn't want to. So he kept battering the, the gates down until finally he says, go, 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 get out of there. And they cross over and God opens the Red Sea and they, they go across on dry land. That's a picture of redemption. And they get into the wilderness on the way to the promised land. But the, the gate has been knocked down so that they can leave. And that's exactly what Jesus So the Joshua of the Old Testament, the Jesus of the Old Testament, Joshua, is now the Jesus of the New Testament. Uh, the, he comes as the Savior, and he's saying, I'm knocking down gates, because he came to do that, take on Satan, mano a mano. And 
also to uh, then say, this is what you're to do as church, as a conquering church, proactively, affirmatively knocking down gates where Satan thinks he uh, has control. He doesn't. And we come with the gospel of good news and grace. So it's a forceful advance of the people of God. When the uh, Jericho was going, you can say, uh, God said, take it, you know, to the Israelites. And they were, and they each ask each other, did you go to boot camp? No, I didn't go to boot camp. How many spears do we have? Well, we have two million, three million of us here. I think we got 10. What about bows and arrows? Well, maybe 10. I mean, we're just not ready. So God said, I'll show you. Because it's a spiritual issue, not just physical. And so he says, walk around the city once a day for six days, then on the seventh day, seven times, and watch what happens. The trumpets blew, boom, the walls fall down, the gates fall away, and there was victory. That's just an image and a picture that's given to us in Old Testament that happens over and over again in the new when we share the good news of Christ, when we're advancing with that good news, knocking down gates. I love the way Paul puts it in Colossians 1.13. It's one of my favorite verses when it comes to this. 113 says that God rescued, past tense, he rescued us from the kingdom of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the son whom he loves. Two kingdoms in opposition, darkness and light. And here comes the light who came into the world, Jesus, and he now says, you are my small capital, uh, a small L light, and you are to go and take that light that you are because I'm the light, and you go into darkness and you knock down that gate, and people who are in darkness see the light, and I will then bring them out. You can take them to security and safety and disciple them. That's what happened, and that's what happened to you. It's happened to me. Every one of us. We're redeemed out of darkness because we were in the clutches of Satan. Even if you grew up in the church, until your heart was given to the Lord Jesus Christ, somebody knocked down the gate of that city that was holding you bondage. And you became believers. The church then has to have that mindset as a conquering church because that's how Jesus works as the king of his kingdom against the kingdom of darkness. It's a, it's a wonderful picture, isn't it? Especially for our, just the way we live daily and also for the church's mission, which is the same mission as Jesus had. There's no difference. It's just that he now, being the one building his church, incorporates us into service. And it, it's done in any number of ways, very quietly sometimes, very boisterously, because he works as he wills. But at least we don't live in fear and don't roll your eyes when you hear such bad news about what's happening about the country. You know, things falling apart. This is the worst time ever in history. You don't know that because you never lived in, through all of history. You, in fact, you need to, if you say that, apologize to the believers who were dipped in pitch tar and Nero's garden and then lit to light his gardens. No one's lighting you to give Nero his gardens light. Every generation faces its ugliness, but we stand firm because we're in Christ. So Christ says, I'm building my church and I'm incorporating you into the process of prevailing and winning. And that's what makes it so exciting to be in the body of Christ and to see what God is doing in the world. And he's, using, he's pleased to use us. So we're not just bumps on a log. We are important. We are indispensable to that end. And in different ways, not everybody does the same thing because all different types of gifts. So please understand that you're, not everybody is on the, the front line of the battle, but we are engaged together as the people of God. So, as the sermon title says, it really is. Christ is really building his church. He really is. And he's using us as the emissaries, the soldiers in that fray. And we're confessing the truth, and that truth will prevail. And Satan ultimately will be defeated because we're going to come over and over again, people like you and me, who once were in bondage, slavery, darkness, have now come into the light. And we follow that light 
And if we are in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Christ cleanses us from all sin. Isn't that beautiful? So I want you to be optimistic, true. Live up to that value, that hope. And actually just look at it yourself. At that point, we see how wonderful it really is. Let's pray. Father, thank you for reminding us that you are the true God, the one that we can confess, and that we will entrust ourselves to you as our faithful creator and redeemer, and that you will uh, put us in the place where we are able to really appreciate and grow in the grace and knowledge of Christ and, and see your church take its place in the world in the right way. That we're not coming slashing with physical swords. We're not trying to kill anybody. We're trying to redeem uh, through the word that you have given as we knock down gates that are holding bondage and bring them out of darkness into the light. Uh, use us, Father, as you choose, and uh, that we will be your emissaries, your, your army in this world. And we thank you that it's not against flesh and blood. It's not the political issue. It's not the economic issues. It's spiritual as you work in us by your grace. In Jesus' name, amen.